to DTX Equals, where thought leaders in digital therapeutics put a stake in the ground on what makes DTX DTX. With me today is Sonia Novitska, CEO at MyPax. Sonia, can you tell us a little bit about MyPax before we get going? Sure, sure, no problem. Thank you, Acacia. Thank you for inviting me to the podcast. So uh, MindPax, uh, who that is a company that I'm a CEO of, is delivering a platform or, or it's uh, producing a platform uh, that is developing digital therapies for uh, patients that are suffering from the most severe mental illnesses. So what we mean by most severe mental illnesses, it is bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, schizophrenia, and uh, lately some of the neurodegenerative uh, diseases that, you know, exploratory we're working on. I have to confess that I um, am a fangirl. Um, I have been trying to get somebody to develop a digital therapeutic for bipolar disorder for a really long time. So I was, um, I actually, um, I saw you speak at a, at a DTX event and uh, got very excited. Um, and, and knew back then I had to have you on my show. So thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited to hear more about you and your story and, um, and your views on the field. So um, with that, What's a formative event in your life or career that influenced your path in DTX? How did you get to where you are? Okay, so uh, I have actually been as many in the field and investment banker for 15 years. <laughs> uh, and uh, what, especially about me being an investment banker, I was actually responsible for solutions that were looking at uh, longitudinal trends. Uh, so math and longitudinal trends is something that is very close to me. And then uh, one of my sons got diagnosed with uh, diabetes type one. So I needed to stop working because he was really small back then. He was around five years old and uh, becoming a carer of a child that is suffering from a chronic disorder that you need to manage on and well, an almost an hourly basis uh, was something that was really new to me. It was it was really nice because I remember the first day uh, when uh, Professor Schumnig here at uh, a hospital in uh, uh, Prague first talked to me, he said, well, it is really good that, um, you know, you have a mathematical and an analytical background because it has been proven that management of diabetes uh, in children is much better with uh, parents that are educated uh, in math and analytics. So um, after a year of, you know, putting my life back together and, um, you know, uh, trying to help um, Michael, uh, big then I've decided that I don't want to go back to banking and a situation arise, an opportunity arise here uh, in Prague to actually join uh, a newly formed company, Mindpax, that was trying to do a similar thing in mental health disorders as what Medtronic and Dexcom and many others uh, have done uh, for diabetes. So this is what has happened with me. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, you know, I, I, it's interesting because I, I, when I interview people and I ask them that topic, there's always some sort of, um, you know, personal brush with the thing that they're, they're working with in some way, um, which I, uh, you know, at least for myself, like I wouldn't be in digital therapeutics if my whole family didn't have mental health. Um, type afflictions kind of running in it and kind of understanding that from a patient perspective can be so powerful um, when you're trying to think about how to, yeah, how to leverage that. So talk to us about um, kind of how you're viewing DTX today with, with the lens that you just described. So DTX equals what for you? What's the most defining issue today as you try and lead a company in DTX? Yes. Uh, well, you know, Mindpax originally uh, wasn't created for a business purpose. It wasn't there initially. Uh, it was only some uh, new co-founders that uh, came lately, including me, that were looking at the business uh, side of the thing. The reason why Mindpax was created at the beginning was to actually develop a new forms of diagnostics, new forms of uh, the abilities to actually understand what is happening in bipolar patients. Um, and I think, uh, you know, for me, when I'm looking at digital therapies, we've only derived to a digital therapy after, you know, quite some amount of years of development. Uh, so for me, uh, when I'm looking at digital therapy, obviously we could use the normal DTA 
you know, uh, classification or the definition that I think is perfectly fine because it's broad and it covers a whole spectrum of the different DTX approaches that we have today that we are seeing today. Where I think we're lacking uh, an explanation a little is uh, what is digital doing in, you know, one of the particular therapies that we are talking about. Because we are seeing, a, you know, a, a whole group of uh, digital uh, therapeutic companies that are actually digitalizing uh, care that is already here in an analog world. Uh, and these are, you know, I, we call them internally DTX 1.0. <laughs> we call them the first, the, the ones that were, you know, easier to come on the market because they would be easier mm -hmm. to, to be digitalized. They were easier to be clinically validated. There were already some, uh, you know, go to market strategies, uh, at least in the analog world. It is not the same, obviously, and, uh, and a lot of innovation needed to come there. And it was great that those, it is really great that uh, those DTX companies exist and, and, you know, a large portion of them in, despite what we're talking about, uh, you know, in the recent, uh, in the recent months after, uh, what has happened to Pear, uh, it is great that they exist because they created the industry as we have it today. And, and we can talk about reimbursement of the DTXs and, 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 you know, we can talk about a lot. But back in the same time, there, there was a whole new bunch of a different DTX companies that were actually introducing digital as a new mechanism of action for treating uh, different diseases. And, uh, and I believe Mindpex is one of those companies. It's one of the companies that is actually delivering treatment that otherwise would not be possible without digital, uh, because it doesn't exist in, exist in the analog world. And, uh, you know, we can be talking about, uh, these type of companies where the, whether the new digital, uh, happens in the diagnostical part, in the AI actually, or, or machine learning or any analytical part, uh, digitally, uh, processed uh, is within the diagnostic part of the DTX in the personalization, the, the ability to actually close loop of the treatment to introduce a digital therapy that is precisely suited for that one particular person at that particular time, which is what Mindpex is doing, or whether we're talking about a whole you know, new dif different kind of ADTX companies where digital actually is the treatment itself. So we're doing some kind of a modification, you know, modulation of, for example, the brain or anything else, uh, the eye, <laughs> the sight, or, uh, you know, some other companies that, that, that are now coming into my mind, where we have not had that type of a treatment in the analog world and is now being introduced because it is enabled by the digital as the means of action. And uh, if we would be talking and educating the whole environment around us, again, you know, introducing how tremendously different these two kinds of digital therapies are, maybe, you know, we would understand each other better. Right from the beginning, you know, right, right from the fundraising, you know, getting the initial funds, whether those are dilutive, non-dilutive, whether those are, you know, pharma sourced or VC sourced or state and fund sourced, uh, uh, whether we're talking about different go-to-market strategies, uh, because obviously for those two kinds or, or many other potentially, but those two are coming into my mind because they're close to my heart <laughs> with mind packs, uh, different go-to-market strategies, you know, some of them might, might be more suited for uh, reimbursement. Some of them might be uh, less suited. Really understanding the clinical validation that needs to come and, and the time to market that is required to actually clinically validate something that is very new and has no alternative in the analog world is just, uh, you know, a very different approach. And, uh, uh, you know, also for uh, co-development strategies or partnership strategies with uh, pharma companies or other, uh, you know, original planners, uh, original players, excuse me, original players on the market. Those are, those are very, very, very different topics. And I just believe that we are not doing enough uh, as, uh, you know, as a DTX society, we're just not, we're not realizing it ourselves enough and we're not communicating, communicating it to the outside world. So that is well understood. Um, and, uh, for me, so for me, digitalization in therapy 
DTX is not only uh, digitalizing, digitalizing something that we have already, but it's bringing digital as a innovative form of delivering new forms of therapies that without digital wouldn't be possible. So they didn't, they, as of today, they don't exist in the analog world. This keeps me up at night, right? Because, you know, the, the field was in large part founded by these, and I don't, I mean this lovingly, like a, the sort of CBT in a box tradition where it's like we've taken something that works and we're just trying to make it digital and convey it in a way that like maybe a person couldn't have reached the therapist. So let's put it in an app. And many of those early solutions were acquired. They were studied in research labs for 20 years and then licensed or purchased. And so the timeline for getting those things tested and validated is exaggerated in the minds of um, you know, investors or the field in general. But if you're trying to do something new, you can't just buy like somebody already did it and digitize it. So if we actually want to innovate beyond CBT in a box, and of course, CBT in a box is, is important. Um, I've been a part of developing numerous CBT in a box type products um, that are very efficacious. But if you're trying to do something where nobody's really intervened in this population before, if you really want to tackle, and this is the thing I want to spend a little bit more time with you about, the closing the loop idea, right? So like if I have a CBT in a box product and I say, go do this thought record, and then they enter it into my product and I'm like, great job on your thought record. Do I know that they did the thought record? Like, do I know that they understood the thought record? So there's there's something that's missing in almost every DTX product I've seen which is the ability to know what we have actually changed about a person's behavior or life. And if it's the eye, we can check how the eye is doing, but if it's psychological or behavioral, we're not good at this. Um, so I would love to hear a little bit more from your perspective of where this is the biggest barrier or like what, how you're tackling, what's the coolest way that you're tackling this actually, I think is an almost a better question. <laughs> Well, thank you for that question. Uh, I love to answer this one. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, well, everyone understands uh, that the biggest problem in mental health is that we are still treating most of the diseases uh, that we are treating purely symptomatologically. So there's nothing that we can actually measure in real world that would that would help us to to really understand what is happening with that one particular patient continuously, right? Uh, and exactly, digitalization is something that might help us with that. And why we are specifically solving for affective disorders is that what we know uh, with affective disorders is that um, affective disorders have a very close relationship to a broken circadian rhythm, right? So they uh, have a very close relationship to how patient, how People that are suffering from these diseases are actually sleeping at night, uh, how regularly, uh, with what length, uh, how, with what structure, and how uh, they are moving throughout the day. So the original idea of mind packs um, back many years ago was that if we can add an objective marker uh, to a measurement to to, 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 to digital course of the disease, to a longitudinal course of the disease, then maybe we would be able to find a crack uh, that stands behind a clinical worsening uh, of, you know, falling into a, uh, falling into a depression or hyping into, uh, into demonia. Uh, well, uh, we have done most probably the biggest clinical study with actigraphy data on this planet. We've recorded 18 plus months of 400 patients here in Czech Republic of a full actigraphic and fully clinically annotated data. So as of today, MindPacks most probably has the largest database of asymptomatologically uh, clinically annotated data together with the actigraphic data of the patients. And I can tell Is that a bipolar? From four, yes, bipolar. Bipolar cool. patients, yes. Uh, and uh, I can tell you the answer is far from 400 patients simple. Okay, most probably, uh, you know, there's many more different types of bipolar than already bipolar, also or, than already 
you know, uh, precisely defined uh, bipolar one and bipolar two. Uh, the disease uh, looks very different and is very heterogeneous, not only in between different patients, but also intra individually. So within one particular patient in, uh, in a long run. And um, so when we are talking closed loop, what we want to make sure is that we really understand the patient in a longitudinal manner. So the whole idea of MindPacks is understand the patients when they're stable, understand what is happening with them, and look for a special trait of that one particular patient that most probably leads to clinical worsening. Detect the risky behavior and target that particular risky behavior with a digital therapy that can be sourced from different therapeutic sources. So we're using interpersonal social rhythm therapy, we're, we're using CBT, we're using uh, chronotherapy, we're also using well-being therapy. But we're we are actually targeting that one pulse, one particular maladaptive behavior that we want to target with a psychoeducational lesson. And the reason for that, there's two reasons. One reason, obviously, we want to educate the patients. But the second reason is we want to help the patients or help the people that are suffering uh, from the disease to actually understand what is happening in their own bipolar disorder. And this is why we call it a closed loop. We, tar we collect the data, we interpret the data, then we detect what we want to do with the data. We show the data to the patients and to the, to the doctor. And then we look back at whether our intervention has actually helped. And this is what we believe is so powerful about our product. But obviously developing a product, collecting the data, clinically validating all of the algorithms, and then clinically, uh, uh, clinically validating the efficacy of such program is very different to a uh, CBT in a box. <laughs> No, it's true. It's and it's not you know this group superior to this group in an RCT because it's uh, what you're you're actually doing new science and uncovering new aspects of the disease at the same time that you're studying it. So um, it's uh, I think a great case for the need for s smarter, more flexible methods for showing that something has efficacy and safety, um, kind of going beyond that RCT model, which um, works great for CBT in a box, but isn't necessarily appropriate for some of the more innovative things out there. Oh, you're so right in this. We've actually, what, how we've actually approached it, because uh, one of the go -to, potential go-to-market strategies uh, for MindPex here in Europe is uh, obviously uh, uh, a DGAF reinvestment scheme in, in Germany. It's one of the potentials we're, you know, investigating many others. And, uh, uh, you know, B-Farm is very familiar. B-Farm, sorry, is um, uh, a German FDA uh, authority. Uh, and they're very familiar uh, with the RCD concept in general. Uh, but what is really tricky is to actually detect the endpoint where you're de-risking the funds that you're putting into a study into actually proving that your system works. And this especially for diseases like bipolar disorder, where on general relapse happens once every one or two years, uh, and hospitalization, you know, every second or third relapse. So that would be, you know, every five years in in, in Germany. Um, with a perfect health almost perfect healthcare system. So uh, so proving a you know, proving that your system actually works in long run uh, is something that is close to impossible uh, to be financed uh, within the RCD. So if you want to finance uh, an RCD like that, or if you want to uh, finance, a, you know, a different study that would actually uh, prove this, you need to utilize the sources that you have. So what we've done in Czech Republic, for example, we have done a mirror image study where we have taken the patients that we have been recorded for in long run and then we introduced a new uh, version of the system, including the feedback, including the digital therapy, including everything. And we've looked at what has changed with the patients. Like if we showed them the data, if we, and we needed to do it without showing the data to HCP because the, the guys patients first. So B Farm didn't allow us to actually show the exact same data to the HCPs, to the treating psychiatrists. Um, and then we were looking at what is actually happening with the patients, like what is the markers that are, uh, what is the objective markers that are helping us to better understand, do they change in long run? 
Um, does the quality of life change if the follow-up is only 12 months? Is it you know, a, a long enough period for a quality of life to actually really change? But then you have you know, forces like uh, you know, social status or, or you know, external uh, effects that are affecting the mirror image study. So uh, in our case, it was uh, COVID that came in and you know, had a tremendous impact on, on the mirror image um, uh, design itself. So we're learning as we go, <laughs> uh, but luckily, uh, luckily the, the, the final results uh, seem to be you know, extremely promising. They're actually, they're very encouraging and, and we are preparing a publication on that. So you have something to look forward to. Uh, very interesting reading. Yeah, especially for a Meganer like me, <laughs> I won't be waiting with bated breath. Um, yeah, no, great to look, I, you know, obviously I think, um, I, uh, I spend a lot of time as somebody that advises people on evidence generation on like what to do and what they're trying to do is different. And so it's been really interesting to hear about that. Um, we are reaching the end of our time, however, so um, I will wrap up and say thank you so much for coming. Thank you for um, shedding a new light on DTX and helping us think about how we have to how we have to get better at thinking about evidence generation. It was a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Acacia. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you.